This video is about how to manage calibrated devices. Over time, we're trying to update the videos for our procedures so people have a little better understanding about the process if they aren't familiar with it before and they're starting a new quality system from scratch. Because that's the bulk of our customers. They're implementing a brand new quality system and launching their first device on the market. So this one's about calibration or monitoring and measuring of devices is what the standard says. But it's devices that monitoring and measure quality of product. So any dimensions or specifications of your product, that's what we're talking about. So how do you measure that? Whether it's a thermocouple or a gauge, uh, a micrometer, a caliper, something like that. So this is gonna specifically talk about what the requirements are and give you a couple of pointers about what this is all about. So let me share my screen and I'll walk you through the presentation. So I think I'm uh, sharing my screen here. Yes, looks like we're good. So this particular page shows you an example of a micrometer. And a micrometer is a, a tool for measuring dimensions of devices or any kind of device, any part you're trying to measure. And it usually has a gauge that gives you a value, what, what that dimension is. Um, and in this particular case, the picture is showing an 8.000 millimeter pin gauge. And it's a particular digital uh, micrometer that they're using to measure this. And we're gonna walk you through some of the details of this type of gauge, the pin gauge, as well as the micrometer that is there as an example of managing calibrated devices. And one of the first things I want you to notice is on this particular gauge, we have a number, right? Right here, we see a number on that gauge, and that tells you what type of gauge that is. It's, it's a pin gauge, but it's specifically an 8.000 millimeter gauge. Sometimes you'll see a plus and a minus on it. If it's a plus, it means it's slightly oversized. Um, and when they say it's slightly oversized to the decimal place, the, the, the very last decimal place, um, it's slightly over the 8.000, it might be 8.0005 or something like that. And if it's a minus gauge, that means it's slightly undersized. So it's really 7.9995, for example, would be a possible measurement of that gauge. And but the, the actual number that they have typed on the gauge, it does meet that requirement, but within a tolerance. So if you have a plus gauge, it's on the plus side. If it's on minus gauge, it's on the minus side. And you can actually buy sets where all the gauges are undersized or all the gauges are oversized. And you when you buy these sets of gauges, you'll actually buy them with a certificate often that will tell you with uh, that somebody's actually gone through the whole entire set and verified with their own traceable calibrated devices that this gauge meets that requirement for a plus or a minus and within the tolerance that's indicated. So I'll show you an example here. We have a whole set of pin gauges on the left. Um, this is a, these two are from Sterrett, which is a very common manufacturer for calibrated gauges. Uh, particularly pin gauges and micrometers and calipers and things like that. And they usually come in a box. It's to protect them from damage when you're storing them. And you pull out the gauge and you use it to measure things. And on the left-hand side, they have what's called a go-no-go -no -go holder. Um, you're, it's actually used to hold the actual pin gauges. You put them in there and you pick one gauge that's on the lower limit of what you want and one limit that's on the higher limit of you what you want. And if it if the go side works, then you 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 know it's the hole is big enough that you're putting the gauge into. And if the red side does not fit, then it's then um and you don't want it to fit. If you can't put the red side in, then that side is too the, the hole is too small for that gauge to fit in. So green should always work and red should never work if you're using a go no go gauge. 
and it they've uh, actually given you the tool so you can make your own. Uh, it's just the holder and then you put the gauges in it from the, the two sides. And that comes with that particular set. And whenever we're using a pin gauge, we usually want to check that it's in calibration. Now you can rely on, on checking the gauges once every year or once every other year, or maybe even once every three years. But the frequency of periodic measurement of those gauges depends on the use of them. If you're going to use them every single day and you're going to use them in a machine shop, they're not going to be good after a few years of using the same gauges um, all the time. Whereas if you're using them only once in a while and you're using them in a metrology lab that's clean and um, everything's at an even temperature and it's air conditioned and everything um, is, is handled with gloves, then you don't have to worry so much about the deterioration of those gauges and them getting worn and scratched. So you can be confident that they're going to be the same measurement this year as they are next year. And you might not need to check the calibration more than every once every three years. Um, but prior to use, it's best practice always to check the calibration before you use it. Um, it may tell you that your micrometer is not in calibration, or it may tell your gauge is not in calibration, but a check is a good idea. And oftentimes we will check micrometers and calipers and devices like that prior to using those as well, not just pin gauges. Um, this is the actual um, regulation for 1345, the 2016 version of the standard. It's a medical device specific standard for quality systems in clause 7.6 is specific to monitoring measuring devices um, used for calibration, um, it, it, or this is the calibration program for uh, devices that are used to measure any uh, component of your medical device or measuring assembly or whatever you're, you're working on. And I've paraphrased here because it's a copy written standard, but the first thing you have to do is you have to de decide what you're gonna monitor and measure. So what, what needs to be monitored and measured in your company? Number two, what equipment do you need in order to do the monitoring and measure? So if you're measuring temperature, uh, if that's something that has to be measured, then what kind of equipment do you need to measure temperature? And then third, what kind of procedures do you need to ensure that the monitoring and measure can be carried out for temperature? So those are the three basic things. The equipment that you choose has to be calibrated or verified. So as I said before, you can have it calibrated. That means somebody else did it and they gave you a certificate and they've labeled it as calibrated, or you can verify it's calibrated prior to use. Or you can do both of those, which I said is the best practice. If you do this at, at specified intervals, so that's okay. And your procedure has to say that, or you could do prior to use. You do not have to use it, do it before and after every use. That would be um, excessive, but some people do that because maybe they drop something and they want to make sure it's still okay. Um, and you want to make sure that it's against a traceable standard. So is it an international or national traceable standard that you're measuring it against? Next, we want to make sure that the, the devices are adjusted and can be readjusted as necessary. So if, if your caliper gets loose, you drop it or something, it needs to be adjusted to get it back in spec, um, you need to be able to adjust that and readjust it as necessary. And every time you do, you have to record that. And the place to record that is in your calibration records. These could be paper records. They could be a, a use log that's sitting um, in a an area where it's designated, this is where we uh, keep the log, or it could be in a computer system. It doesn't have to be one way or another. You pick which one works best for your company, um, but you need to be consistent. That's the key is consistency. You have to identify what the calibration status is. Usually there's a little sticker that indicate what the gauge number is, what the time period is for um, the calibration, um, so is it good until, you know, it was done on this date and it's good until this date is a typical, and it will usually have the initials or uh, signature of the person did it, or sometimes a clock number uh, will be used. 
you have to make it safe from adjustments. So a lot of times it will have a, if it has an electronic system and a battery, they'll have a sticker covering the opening to the battery compartment. So if you break the seal, you know that you have to redo the validation or calibration of that device. So that, that's another way they protect it from adjustment adjustments. Um, another thing that you're gonna do is prevent it from being damaged. So you wanna put it back in the box. You wanna put the box in a storage location that's clean and dry. You're not gonna want it in a salty environment like the, by the seashore. You're not gonna want it out in, the, out in your car or truck. You're gonna want it in a safe place. It doesn't necessarily have to be a metrology lab with temperature control and humidity control, but that would be ideal. And so the more sensitive, the more precise those tolerances are, the more likely you're going to have to go into a very uh, protected environment like a metrology lab. And the less precise it is, the more we can get away with crude measurements in dirt and grime and things like that, like a machinist would have to deal with when they're machining a part. And then we have uh, procedures that you have to have in place for performing the calibration and monitoring of all those gauges, you have to assess the validity of your previous measurements. So I took a measurement yesterday, and then I found out today that that gauge was out of calibration for some reason. Now I have to go back and figure out, was were those results um, still valid? So I might have to measure it again. Um, I might have to take the product that I used to measure it off the market. Or I might be able to say, well, my gauge was only out um, by a, a thousandth of an inch or a, a tenth of a millimeter or something like that. And the tolerance was much, much bigger than that. So therefore, even if it was out of tolerance, uh, it wasn't the calibrated properly anymore, it still wouldn't have been bad. It still would have been conforming product. And I don't have to do anything about the product. All I have to do is worry about the gauge. So that assessment is something you have to worry about and you have to document the, that assessment as well. You have to record all the results of your calibration. That's one of the requirements. And you should have either a form for doing that or a log for doing that or a computer system. And then you want to document your procedures for validation of any computer software if you do use software to manage your calibrated devices. A typical one out there would be gauge track, but honestly, all this is, is um, this is the gauge, this is the date I calibrated it, this is the, the date it's due for calibration next, this is where it's located, this is the method I used, and here's the result. And all of the result can just be an attachment. So if you have somebody that has the ability to program a database, you could make your own very, very quickly. It's it's a uh, sort of a, an Excel spreadsheet on steroids. It's a database software, makes it very easy to organize different types of data, like pictures and records, as well as quantitative data. But you do not need to go out there and spend tens of thousands of dollars on gauge track. If, if you have the ability to program your own database, you could create that one just for this that's organized exactly the way you want it. But then you will have to validate that database and there's actually soft, I'm sorry, a standard out there for validation of um, software databases for calibration. The standard is ISO TIR 80002-2, and it's a 2017 standard. Um, this next page is an actual copy and paste right from the FDA regulations. It covers all the same elements. There isn't anything that's fundamentally different between what the requirements are for the FDA and the ISO standards. So if you comply with one, you should be compliant with the other. This is the intent of the, the requirements, but how you actually do it, the particulars are what's in your procedure. So you don't just copy and paste from the regulation or copy and paste from the standard. You gotta write your own procedure that meets these requirements. So you're not gonna have a half page procedure. You're gonna have a multiple page procedure, but it also it's not very complex. There are only a few requirements here, so you can write a fairly short, concise procedure that's fairly easy to understand. So that, that's what our company has created for, for our clients. 
This is an example of a bench mic. It's a little different from the micrometer that I showed you earlier. Um, a bench mic sits on a bench in a work area, typically a very stable, secure, safe area where the device won't get damaged. And bench mics are great because you don't have to hold the, the bench mic. You just set it on the table and it stays there. And you can hold one hand on the piece that you're measuring and another to adjust uh, the measurement until it reads the right value. So it frees up your hands. You don't have to have one hand holding the device. Um, and it stays very stable and it's not likely to get out of calibration. Like something you have in your hand and put pick up, put down, pick up, put down that can damage the device and cause it to be out of calibration slightly. So any handheld device is going to be inherently less stable in get out of tolerance faster than something that sits on a bench top. So the bench micrometers are much more stable, much more suitable for checking once a year or even less frequent than that potentially. And so what a lot of companies will do is instead of having paying the money to have all their gauges calibrated every year, all those little pin gauges, the better way is to just calibrate the bench mic. And before you use the pin, you measure it to make sure it's calibrated properly and then write down on the log that you've verified prior to use. So you keep the log right next to the bench mic in a nice safe place where you store all your pin gauges. So that's best practice. And so if you have a company that has thousands of gauges, um, this is a way to save some money on calibrating all those gauges you just calibrate the bench mic and verify prior to calibration, I mean, see, prior to measurement for the other gauges like pin gauges. Now, this is an example of another bench mic. It's just a different brand. Uh, it's Mitatoyo. Um, so that's a very popular company that makes typically digital gauges instead of analog gauges, like the other ones I showed you. But this person's wearing gloves. So this person's wearing gloves because they want to protect the uh, gauge that they're measuring from getting any kind of oils from your hands and corroding. So metals corrode very easily and the oils and moisture on our hand can corrode them. So that's one reason why people wear gloves. The other is this is a very, very precise bench mic, not your average one out there. And you can tell by the number of digits. It's got four digits after the decimal instead of three. Those are rare and they're expensive and they're very hard to keep in calibration. So a handheld one would not be suitable. This is a one where they've clamped it and put it on a, on a bench. So the, this is technically a handheld device, but nobody would ever hold it in their hand. They instead put it in a clamp to keep it stable and make it easier to measure. And that's the right way to use something like this. Um, but the the base doesn't need to be calibrated, just the handheld part. Um, so that, that's an interesting way of taking that approach of converting a handheld device into a bench mic. And it works very, very well. Um, and we're seeing all kinds of companies go to more and more precise measurement devices to try to get tighter tolerances in, in more precision with any of their measurement. Um, and it's becoming more and more common and, and the quality professionals that are using those devices have to adjust the way they do things in order to use those high precision equipment. If you're interested in more information, I, I borrowed this uh, picture from the, the article that's down there. Um, it's from Quality Magazine. So if you're a quality professional and you want to learn more about um, this, these kinds of things, they have a fantastic article on measurement with micrometers that you might be interested in. If you need a procedure for calibration, we're selling our procedures. Um, this one is calibration, so it's SYS 16. And I've provided a hyperlink at the bottom for uh, the procedure. So you can actually go to that website link and purchase it. And it's in our eighth revision of the procedure. Um, we're changing the way we mark revisions. Instead of saying it's a draft, we're indicating that it is a beta version by the first number after the decimal, or sorry, before the decimal place is a zero. So like in software, it's a beta version. And in, when you have a commercial release, it becomes 1.0.
and the revision, uh, the number is after the decimal place. So this is the eight uh, draft of uh, this beta version. And then once you make it part of your quality system, you make it 1.0. And of course you change the company name to your company name and use your own logo and your own name. But um, if you're interested, go visit our, that webpage and it's for sale. And for the month of November, it'll be half price. Uh, you just use the discount code Alicia. I hope that helps and um, hope you found this video um, informative. If you have any other questions, uh, please don't hesitate to post a question in our YouTube video comments, or you can also post one on our website. We also have a um, frequently asked, uh, sorry, a, um, um, a suggestion box page where you can type in questions. So if you, you're looking for a suggestion box, just type in suggestion and that'll pop up and it'll, there'll be a form for you to enter questions, or you can contact somebody in our company and schedule a meeting to ask more involved questions. I hope that helps and um, please give us any ideas for future videos. Bye-bye.